I don't even know what these people are chanting. What are they chanting? Can you hold this for me, please? Oh, yeah. Anna. It's black and white. Hi. Yeah. Anna. Yes. Matt. Hi, Matt. Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. We got a big crap. All right. Hello. Um, you're going to give me that mic? After I'm done. I think we're ready to get started, right? Okay. Well, uh, this is Ann Coulter versus Anna Kasparian. Before we get started, just want to thank you. This is the third Politicon. At the first Politicon, a couple of weeks ago, we had sold about 138 tickets. Very often when you announce in on a panel, you get another couple thousand people. Your first Politicon, you debated Jenk. You had about 1,000 people in the room just for that panel, right? Uh, so thank you, Ann. This is your third Politicon. Thank you very much. And Torrey, this is your third yes, it is. as well. Uh, so I want to thank you for making this uh, a, su a success. I think we're going to have about 10,000 people this weekend. So thank you for that. So I'm just going to introduce Torrey, who uh, is the co-host of Binge Worthy on the People TV Network. But also, I think you've written five books. Last one about Prince. Is that right? <laughs> Last book about... Are you also a, a uh, voter in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? The Rock I Hall of Fame? was on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominating committee. This is a renaissance man, and uh, he's going to be hosting this panel now. I'm going to turn it over to Torrey. It's a fun thing. Hi, hello, thank you. How are you guys? Are you having a good Politicon? Well, hopefully this will be the highlight of your day. We have a serious intellectual fight. I'm not going to call it a cat fight because both these people are serious intellectual people. We're going to have a discussion as people. We're not going to have a melee, right? And, and a cat fight would be sexist. I, I agree. I agree. Although somehow you guys seem to have dressed for the occasion in black and white, like opposite sides of the coin. So look, it's supposed to be a debate, but there's not going to be a winner or loser. I'm going to put out a question. It will go to both of you. One person will go, then the other person will go. If you want to re-respond, you can. I want to avoid more than four whacks at one question, so we get through a bunch of questions. Uh, the ladies decided they wanted to talk about Trump, immigration, and criminal justice, so we're going to focus on those three areas. Um, first question... Do you like my beard? Because it's a new thing that I'm trying. Is it working or it not? It looks really? great. You can be honest. I mean, beers are super in right now. Really? So I'm into it. it. She's considering it. See, all right, here we go. I like it. Yeah, I she's like all it. for it, and she's like, I'll tell you later. Okay. Yeah. Um, <gasps> and no longer. Is, uh, is Trump an effective, being an effective president so far? First to you, and then to you. Um, well, it's been, what, seven months, and if I try to think of what your... This is the problem. I can try moving it up. Is that better? My hair will hang. Can you hear me? Is that working? Yes. Yes. I think you can hear me now. Somebody, somebody's coming to help Anne's mic. Let me start with you, and then we'll come back to you so we keep it moving. Uh, is Trump being an effective president so far? I think Trump has done a really good job at being effective in creating scandal in the White House. And I have to be, I have to be quite honest, um, it's a little disturbing to read articles like what just came out from The New Yorker with Ryan Lizza and uh, some of the statements that were made by Scaramucci, who was supposed to be here but apparently didn't show up. Um, you know, we are supposed to have some level of civility in government, regardless of what political affiliation you have. And right now, we are dealing with a Russia scandal. We're dealing with infighting within the White House. We're dealing with all sorts of chaos. And there have been no legislative wins so far. Now, Anne's right. It's been seven months. But remember, when Trump was campaigning, he made a lot of promises about what he's going to do on day one. What he's going to do on day one. Well, what has he done since day one? I mean, he has 
definitely applied for more uh, visas for foreign workers to come in and work for his properties. He's definitely done that. He has increased the cap for foreign workers to come into the country. And so he basically turned his back on his base, and I'm unsure whether or not they're even aware of that. So, no, he hasn't been an effective president. If anything, there's been a lot of entertaining drama and scandal, but that's it. Um, well, I was going to say, I don't... For one thing, I would not consider the Scaramucci interview the highlight of the Trump presidency so far. Um, but I was trying to remember... Can you really not hear me? <laughs> you seriously can't hear her? I'm getting a lot of thumbs up. I know this is crazy, but I kind of want to adjust it, because I mic myself every day. Do you mind if I do it? Ooh, we're, look at that unity already! Here. All right. Here. No, I can't, it can't be on that side. Can okay, you throw your so hair over your shoulder? There you go. go ahead, Talk a little. One, two, three, four, five. How's that working? Can you hear me? I think we're going to have to do that. Um, what I was saying about the seven months is when I think about, you know, before 9-11, what did Bush do? I don't remember anything until um, Obamacare passed. I don't remember anything uh, Obama did. Uh, so, yeah, there's been a lot of excitement, some of which I'm not that thrilled about. But is he an effective president? Well, how do you judge that? What did he run on? What did he promise? Uh, I think none of his supporters, maybe some of them, really just thought it would be fun to have this tacky billionaire in the White House. Um, I think most people thought, no, he's the only one raising the issues we have been dying to have some president raise. And, you know, screw you Republicans, screw you Democrats. We're going to put this nut in the Oval Office because he will at least put Americans first and not Wall Street first. And has he done that? Well, in seven months, um, he's really going after MS-13. He's attempting to prevent terrorists from coming into the country. Um, the courts, so we're getting massive resistance from the Democrats, as usual, as we got during the civil rights era. Um, but he'll win in the end. Um, he's interviewing for the wall. Uh, he has a fantastic attorney general. He has a fantastic head of ICE. Um, so as for what he has promised and whether he's implementing it, um, I'd give him a B. I'm looking for an A by the midterms. I, 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 w I want to be like Switzerland, like Gwen Eiffel here and not take a side. But occasional things may jump out at me. Do you want to respond to that? I, I just want to. I want to. If you don't mind, I would like yeah, to respond. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but did, um, just, just sure. want to. Do you does the president think that he has a fantastic attorney general? <laughs> he <Okay>. seems to <laughs> not agree with you. <laughs> um, well, if we're going to get into the flaws of the of the Trump administration, I mean, I think the 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 original sin was something that I've been perfectly open with with him and the world about. Americans don't like nepotism. I don't think he should have brought his uh, son-in-law into the White House. And I think a lot of this has to do with him being worried about the investigation going after his son-in-law. I think he's right not to want an independent counsel. There's a reason. Congress got rid of the independent counsel law. You can't just have this unaccountable roving commission looking at everything you've ever done. I understand. I feel his pain. I feel his frustration. But no, you shouldn't be, um, you know, S posting your own attorney general. Um, if you don't like him, fire him. You're the president. Um, but look, he's done. I, I don't think that is nearly as bad as the first thing I didn't like that he did. And it's really just about two things. And that was, you know, one of the things we voted for, don't get us involved in any more pointless wars. And that bombing of Syria, again, mm, I see a little, a little nepotism issue here. I mean, the claim in the New York Times and the Washington Post was Ivanka saw some pictures of, of children and started crying. Oh, daddy, daddy, we have to bomb Syria. So Ivanka cried, kids died. But his base punched back, and at least we are not involved in a war in Syria. And by the way, we would have been in Syria, in Russia, um, in Iran, if it had been 
anyone else running for president with the possible exception of Bernie Sanders. So I would say he's effective. He hasn't gotten us involved in a pointless war, and he is pretty well following through on, on the immigration stuff. He's pretty well following through on the trade stuff. That's all I care about. I don't care about the tweets. I love the tweets. All right. So there's, there's quite a bit to jump in on. Um, but the first thing that I want to address is this notion that he is not escalating um, war abroad, which is completely false. So within the first three months of his presidency, he actually escalated uh, some of Obama's foreign policy in the form of drone strikes. In fact, it increased 423 percent. We are bombing like crazy in places like Yemen. Okay? And this whole notion that, you know, oh, this Muslim ban is trying to keep the terrorists out of the country. Doesn't anyone else find it a little strange that Saudi Arabia, one of the countries that was obviously involved in what happened on 9-11, is not part of that Muslim ban? Right? So, I mean, I know that the right wing has been very vociferous in terms of trying to make Saudi Arabia pay some consequences for it. Trump isn't making him pay any consequences because he has financial interests there. Um, I want to go way back to what you said about, you know, legislative wins and policy. When it comes to the issue of immigration, it's kind of fascinating because Obama got a lot of criticism for being soft on immigrants, right? But by the end of 2010, he had allocated $12 billion toward border security, and he had hired 40,000 new border agents. As a result, less undocumented immigrants were coming in, more of them were leaving. Between 2005 and 2010, we actually had 1.5 uh, 1 million undocumented immigrants leave the country, mostly because of economic reasons. The economy in Mexico was starting to do a little better, and people wanted to leave. So there were wins when it came to Obama. He did do things, and he got a lot of criticism from the left when it came to his immigration policy. Policy. But the reality is Donald Trump hasn't done anything yet other than attempt to ban people from some Muslim countries and pretend like he's a tough guy. In reality, he's not a tough guy. He hasn't succeeded in anything. And health care is the latest example of that. Well, I won't waste a lot of time saying what I agree with you on, couldn't agree with you more on Saudi Arabia. The only thing I'll say in response to that is every single general, every single presidential candidate wants to suck up to Saudi Arabia. That's right. Trump is the most anti war and, and by the way, I'll throw one in for you. Um, we're continuing this pointless Obama war in Afghanistan. We've been in there 17 years. What are we doing there? But all of his advisors and, and all of your favorite Republican, John McCain and Lindsey Graham, oh, no, they want a full-blown, you, you know, a relationship with Saudi Arabia, and we'll go to war in Syria, we'll go to war in Russia. No, Trump is, at least on the war front, he, he's doing better than anybody else would have. As for, you know, Obama being a kick-ass on... Um, a t hard ass on immigration. No, this is a total lie. Um, two quick points I will make. One is um, this is a Washington metric that um, if you spend more money, you're getting serious about it. No, spending money on border patrol means uh, more government workers, more unionized workers, more taxpayer money. It does not mean more enforcement. And what Obama did to make it look like they were doing enforcement is they redefined deportation. It used to be, you know, for 50 years, you turn somebody away at the border. That's not a deportation. You turned them away at the border. Suddenly, under Obama, they started describing the turn them away at the border as a deportation. So, you know, it's like a failing school saying, um, we just changed the passing grade from, from 70 to 40. And look, all the kids passed. Um, that, that's what we got under Obama. We're getting deportations. You wouldn't have so many people weeping about the deportation. There was just another, uh, another one, in, I think in Bloomberg yesterday, um, someone weeping about, uh, it was an ICE, an ICE agent saying, oh, these ICE agents are coming to me and they actually want to deport people. No, ICE is able to do its job now and they haven't been, not under Obama, not under Bush. All right, All first, right. first to you. I, I need to respond to that uh, because there were a lot of um, misleading statements that you mentioned, and I'll tell you why. So um, the Obama administration certainly did deport more people than the Bush administration, and it was not just people being turned away at the board. I'll give you the numbers, okay? So first of all, uh, the... 
12 billion dollars that he allocated for border security went toward hi hiring 40,000 border agents. So it was not to increase the bureaucracy. It was to include or add to what we already had uh, at the border. Now you mentioned the ICE agents and all the people crying about how mean they are. I'm curious what you think about um, the border agents that are now being sued by the ACLU for molesting two teenage girls who are coming in from Guatemala. Does that make you feel bad at all? Something else a wall would solve. Um, again, having border, having border agents, hiring border agents is not keeping illegal immigrants out of the country. And we know that because Obama was welcoming unaccompanied children. What the border agents were doing, this wonderful 40,000 border agents was, was handing them a pass, putting them on a bus to the interior of the country. That wasn't deportation, it was the welcome force down at the border. You put up a wall, you don't have to worry about paying unemployment, paying workman's comp, they don't have to go to sleep, they don't slack off, they don't molest illegals, the wall just sits there they day and them. night, not right. having to sleep, eat, um, they're, they're actually... You know, it's incredibly misleading to say that we need to build a wall because the fact of the matter is we 100% already have a wall. We have a 2,000 mile long border that we share with Mexico, right? Um, about 1,000 miles are already covered by a wall. The rest, we're talking about a river and we're talking about treacherous terrain. We're talking about mountains, okay? One of the reasons why he hasn't built the wall yet is because it's almost impossible to build the wall in the areas that we're talking about. There's a ton of issues with building the wall in the remaining area, including U.S. properties. We have resorts, we have U.S. properties that would essentially be divided in half if we continued building that wall. And by the way, it's a gigantic waste of resources. How about our taxpayer money actually go back to us as American people? How about that? Okay. All right. So you brought up health care. We're all thinking about health care, a huge issue this week. Trump care for now is dead. Is it? It's not a, We're only going to get about three statement. questions if you keep this up. <laughs> uh, is it right for the president to say, let Obamacare fail? Um, I'll answer that in a minute. Everything she said about the wall was false. When liberals no. start you complaining guys about the yourself. budget, <laughs> whenever a liberal is worried about federal spending, come on, it's not a presidential debate. There's We're you should your question. antenna should go up. There's 700 miles of fence. It's about as high as this table. And if a wall is so ineffective, then stop complaining about it. Not going to make a difference. Fine. Then don't be so hysterical. Um, as for Obamacare, <laughs> it's very simple. I, I mean, I think, I think Trump made the mistake of allowing Paul Ryan to set the agenda. President Trump got to Washington with both political parties, the entire bureaucracy, and the entire legacy media against him. He, it wasn't his job to, to you know, find the proper replacement for Obamacare. That should have been done by the Republicans who've had seven years to do it. And they didn't do it. It was a disaster. What, I mean, unfortunately, this is, this is the problem with, with my party. They accept the behemoth. They act like they're free marketers. Um, and then they, um, you know, our big change to, to give you an example, and it happens to be a perfect metaphor here, when Ronald Reagan ran for president, one of his campaign promises was, was eliminating the Department of Education. Today's Republican Party, their idea of like Austrian economics is no child left behind. Well, no, that's, that's not getting rid of the Department of Education and sending education back to the states. We want a real free market solution. I think what they should have done with Obamacare, which I have been writing about, I've been screaming from the rooftops, is don't touch it. The whole key is separating the welfare cases from the free market cases. You do not repeal Obamacare. Anybody who wants Obamacare gets it, but you pass a one-sentence law saying there shall be a nationwide free market in health insurance. That has been the problem for basically since the 60s with health insurance. You can't buy in health insurance the way you buy everything else. The free market works its magic. You get good products at good prices. Okay. But, but the question was, is it right for the president to say this policy, which I don't support, mm -hmm. let that policy fail 
with the attendant pain that would cause too many people? I mean, of course it's not right. We elected someone, I mean, I didn't partake in electing him, but this country elected someone with uh, the intention of him uh, representing us and representing our best interests. And unfortunately, he would much rather win some political brownie points as opposed to looking out for us and improving upon um, legislation that was passed by Obama. And so, look, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like the Affordable Care Act is perfect. It's something that we were criticizing Obama for quite a bit, especially because it lacked the proper cost controls and because it was essentially a gigantic handout to private industry. And, you know, this notion that if we just make it a free market system, we had a free market system. And guess what? A lot of people had no access to health insurance because they were being denied for pre existing conditions. So there are a lot of positive things I'm talking. There are a lot of positive things that came out of the Affordable Care Act, including, don't get emotional, including allowing us, allowing us to purchase health insurance without fear that we have a pre-existing condition, allowing tw people up to the age of 26 to remain on their parents' health insurance. There were a lot of positive things, but it was flawed. And instead of Republicans coming in and saying, hey, you know what, let's find a way to lower these premiums. Let's find a way to improve upon this, this you know, legislative win that the Democrats had, they're like, no, let's let it implode. In fact, either let's let it implode or let's just take health insurance away from tens of millions of Americans. That's not leading, that's not representing the best interests of Americans. Um, I was trying to guide you. We did not have free market health insurance before Obamacare. We haven't had free market health insurance, anything resembling it since, I don't know, 1940 or 50, even then we didn't. Um, um, but we do have a free market, or pretty much of a free market, in things like flood insurance, car insurance, so you have some idea how it works. And if you live in California, you aren't forced to buy health insurance for hurricanes. If you live in Florida, you are not forced to buy insurance for earthquakes. Um, a real free market in health insurance would get so many people off the welfare side of it, um, we could see how it how it would work? We have, there's an exception to Obamacare right now that allows a sort of free market if you're, if you say you're a Christian outfit. Um, so there, the, and probably any sort of religious group can say, we're, we're in this together. It's not technically insurance. It costs $50 a month, but you don't have to pay for lots of stuff you don't need. It's what's known as health insurance. People put their money together every month. Um, and until y you're thinking about this the same way, unfortunately, my party is thinking about it. No, we start with the assumption um, that there will be a huge government program and make teeny tiny little edits. No, just allow us to buy health insurance the way we buy um, orange juice, um, shoes, houses, computers, all these things, cell phones, flat screen TVs, all these things get better and cheaper over time through the magic of the free market. You, I always feel like I'm explaining to a little Soviet woman um, after the end of the, the Cold War how she's going to get bread if the government doesn't provide it. No, it's amazing. It's the free market. Um, and that's what they need to do. So uh, typically... Typically, after a difficult election, uh, the leader would try to bring the country together. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's a partisan point to say that Trump has clearly been focused on his supporters and policies that they want and is not making any effort to sort of bring over people who are not, not even to, with a speech to mollify people who were not originally with him. Can, two questions, can he win over some progressives and should he try? I mean, I feel like he needs to work on winning over some members of his own party first, because he seems to be having a difficult time with that. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, politics have become so divisive and so incredibly polarized. And I don't think he genuinely has an interest in reaching across the aisle and, and convincing progressives to work with him. I mean, he's made progressives the enemy. And so I, I don't really see much hope for that. But what I do somehow now miraculously see is some hope in terms of members of Congress, members of Senate working together to come up with some better solutions. And, you know, he might threaten Susan Collins and, and Lisa Murkowski, but I give them a tremendous amount of credit for actually sticking to their guns and representing the best interests of their constituents. To you, can he win over some progressives and should he even try? 
I hardly think you can blame Donald Trump for the divisiveness in the country, for Pete's sake. Um, but I mean, obviously he did. Uh, he won over, I don't know, I, I don't know what you mean specifically by progressives, but obviously he won a lot of Democrats over. Democrats, the old Reagan Democrats. I mean, there was this, this the big Stan, Stanley Greenberg, he's the big pollster for the Democratic Party, um, went from Yale Law School and, he's, and he spends a lot of money and takes a lot of time and he's been going to one county, Macomb County in Michigan, um, every four years because that's like a microcosm of the Reagan voters. He's been polling them, polling them. They voted, this county voted twice for Obama and went for Trump. Um, that was the big swing. That is what gave Trump Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan. I, I, I think those voters are pretty much unavail unavailable to progressives as they're current, currently constituted. There was just a quote, maybe some of you saw this, I think it, it was, I don't know, in the New Yorker, but somebody was interviewing a Trump voter in Arizona um, and said, look, the reason I, I, I love Trump and I hate I hated Hillary was they hated Trump for all the reason that they hate me. And that is how working class, middle class Americans are feeling right now. And I mean, it was the deplorable line from Hillary, Hillary was all, only, um, you know, the most, the most piercing example of that. Um, so no, I think if, tr if Trump fulfills his promises, he will continue to get these Democrat votes. He might win over some progressives. I never understood why progressives were so anti-Trump. He's hardly religious right. I mean, he's been married three times to a model. You're worried about mandatory Bible readings with him. He's not Mr. Wall Street. He got no money from Wall Street. Um, he's kind of secularist. You don't know what you're talking about if you're sneering at that. Um, so why he should be so upsetting to, to the left, I think it's because um, he represents what they do hate and what it is I'm talking about. He represents the Walmart voter. And they know we can't attack the Walmart voter, but we can attack the billionaire who represents the Walmart voter. Um, I'm loving this audience. You guys are fun. Um, I have, oh wow, okay, so Trump recently said that the reason why he has filled his cabinet with millionaires and billionaires is because he doesn't want poor people working for him in, in the White House. And so it's, it's odd to me that working class Americans would think that he would want to represent them or even thinks highly of them when in reality, time and time again, he has not supported them. Uh, another example was a story that we did years ago about how he believes golf should be reserved for the wealthy. That if you're from the, a higher class, socioeconomic status, golf is for you. But if you're poor, no golf for you, which is ridiculous. Like, who cares about golf? But it kind of gives you his mindset. But here's one thing that we can agree on. One of the reasons why Trump was able to flip voters is because he did campaign on something that I think the Democrats dropped the ball on, with the exception of Bernie Sanders. He talked about jobs, okay? Uh, Hillary didn't talk about jobs, at least didn't do so in a substantive way that was convincing and persuasive. He pretended like he was going to look out for people who had lost their factory jobs, people who had lost their jobs because the coal industry is no longer uh, something that makes any sense in this country, right? So he's reaching across, you know, he's reaching out to them and saying, I'm going to look out for you, I'm going to look out for you. But has he looked out for them? Why is he applying to have foreigners come into this country and work on his properties? If he cares about employing these poor people who have lost their jobs, why wouldn't he hire them? That's what I want to know. And so, look, Talk is cheap. We know that talk is cheap. And we've seen cheap talk from Democrats and Republicans. But I think it's absolutely ridiculous to claim that Donald Trump is looking out for the best interests of poor Americans who have lost their jobs. If he really genuinely cared about that, then maybe he would practice what he preaches a little bit. And you, you talk a lot about immigration. Let's slide into the immigration portion of the afternoon, evening. Um, what is the reason why most people who are immigrants come to live in America? It varies. It varies quite a bit. Um, 
I also want to say Bernie Sanders dropped the jobs issue and dropped the working class issue. Why? Because he's put through the meat grinder of one of the main political parties. Um, and you are not going to get, it is the uniparty in Washington against the people. That was what Trump represented. And, then, and the proof of that was the interview, the interview that Bernie gave, I think it was to Salon, and he was, said something about, he was asked about, I remember the guy that, that Oh, I can't think of his name right now. Anyway, um, who said, well, yeah, of course, you're for open borders. And Bernie Sanders said, no, that's a Koch brothers idea. They want the cheap labor. That was what his position used to be. But then, oh, no, has to be for open borders because he's running as a Democrat. That is what hurts the working class, the, um, the low-wage workers more than anything else. We're just going to keep dumping more low-wage workers on the country. And that is in answer to your question. I mean, a lot of them are coming for the welfare benefits now. As Milton Friedman said, you can't have a welfare state and open borders. Um, and we're getting a lot of that now. Pre-1970 immigrants, pre-1970 immigrants made more money, bought bo more houses than the people who already lived here. Post-1970 immigrants, um, vastly poorer than the people who already live here. Well, that's just competing for resources, both for government benefits and for jobs from our own poor people. How about we bring in people to compete with, with, with talk show hosts and senators um, and governors and uh, Wall Street bankers? Then we'll see you know, how much compassion we have for the rest of the world. But Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want somebody to compete with him for his job. He wants some to bring in people to compete for his landscaper's job. Um, th that is how Donald Trump cares about the people uh, who are being hurt and have been left behind and ignored by both political parties for decades now. I have a response to that. So. All it takes is a quick Google search to find that undocumented immigrants have no access to government benefits. In fact, yes, in fact, in 1996, uh, Bill Clinton and uh, legislators at the time made it incredibly difficult for uh, immigrants who are in the country legally to have access to uh, government benefits or, or government programs. And so it's a complete fear-mongering talking point from the right that people are coming into this country and they're mooching off American taxpayers. The only people who are mooching off of American taxpayers right now are oil companies and the wealthiest people who... It's, it's, it's really a great, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great distraction to have Americans look at the little guy and blame them for all their problems when the wealthiest people in this country are basically raping and pillaging us, right? So that's what's happening. To go back to Therese's original question about why people are coming into this country, um, right now, Immigration from Mexico, so Mexican immigrants, is down, okay? Uh, Mexicans are not trying to come into the country the way they were before, mostly because of some of our um, policies, but more importantly because their economy is doing better, right? So they, they have no reason to come here. Economic reasons was the main reason why um, Mexican uh, immigrants were coming into the U.S. But all of a sudden we're seeing an increase of people from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador trying to cross the border first of all, cross the border into Mexico and then cross into the United States, which has become pretty impossible considering the increased border security that we have because of the Obama administration. Now, why are they trying to come in? Well, there have been spikes in violence in those countries. Okay, there have been uh, drug traffickers, cartels that have increased violence. Uh, you've heard about, you know, decapitations and all that stuff. Well, the reason why they're so powerful is because of the drug war that you're very supportive of. We've spent one trillion dollars on the war on drugs since 1971. We're not only wasting our resources, we're literally fueling drug cartels in other countries, which is upping the ante when it comes to undocumented immigration in the country. So that's what's happening. Uh a lot of studies show that the number one reason that immigrants give for illegally crossing the border is family reunification. They want to reunite with their family. Do you think that it is immoral to break uh, immigration law?
to reunite with your family? Um, it is a total lie that illegal immigrants do not get um, all kinds of government assistance. Please do Google that. But don't just look up. Any idiot can write on the internet. Look it up. They can get Please food stamps, up. they go into emergency rooms, they get schooling, they get English as a second language, they get the SNAP program. Um, whoa, they get full health care in California. Um, it is not saying that illegal immigrants are the little guy. They're not our guys. Americans don't have a problem paying for our own poor, our own sick, our own injured. But the idea is, we're like a family. We're all in this together. Aren't you in favor of welfare reform? And you say, but, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Okay, but you don't get to, this isn't the entire world we're talking about. We're not turning America into, you know, the universe's charity ward. We need to take care of our own. Um, and that's what's hurting the little guy. Um, the reason illegal immigrants say they're coming for family reunification is because that, that's what you got you a free bus pass and a box lunch in the Obama era, whatever they need to say, to be moved into the interior of the country. But this idea that, oh, oh, I have, you can't break up my family. Well, okay, all of you go back then. I think it's hilarious that you're sitting here saying that you care about taking care of our poor people and spending our taxpayer money on government programs that help our poor people. Um, you've been on the record on multiple occasions talking about how much you hate the welfare state. And so you don't care about taking care of anyone. You care about lower taxes for yourself. And that's pretty much it. And and if, I and just tried to explain, but again, it's like talking to the old Soviet woman who doesn't grasp the free market. Name calling this is super isn't a classy. question of whether we take care of our poor. And I must say, um, immigration makes everything harder. And one of the biggest things it makes harder um, is the distribution of of welfare. Um, look at all of the scams on welfare. Is that going to the poor? No, it's going to the Russians in Brighton Beach, it's going to the Cubans in Miami, it's going to the Arabs up in, in Michigan. Um, one thing that, that um, immigrants, legal and illegal, uh, really have quite a strong pro proclivity for that is not part of our Native uh, American, even our Native American criminals, are massive financial flaw frauds and government frauds. They don't consider themselves part of our kin, part of our family. It isn't that they're, we're all in this together. Um, the, the, America is like Disneyland uh, to these criminals. It is ripping off all of these systems. To, so to say you want um, welfare to be, to be distributed in a way that is useful, that helps people, that gives them, um, allows them to get work and jobs, um, is not being against helping the poor, it is being for helping the poor. Away from the financial and economic part of immigration, which we have discussed extensively here, mm -hmm. on the cultural piece, would sure. America benefit from limit limiting or eliminating immigrants? Well, I mean, I think it makes sense to limit immigrants. We do have, I mean, our resources are not, you know, they're finite. So, of course, it but makes I mean, sense but, to limit. But, 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 but just culturally, because we've culturally. done the financial economic I mean, part. look, I'm not afraid of different cultures, right? Um, I, I'm not afraid of people speaking Spanish. It doesn't get me emotional. It doesn't make me feel scared. And I know that there are some people who feel afraid <laughs> of that happening. Um, my parents are immigrants. You know, my dad was born in Syria. My mom was born in Armenia. I was born here in Los Angeles. And nothing makes me happier than seeing different cultural, uh, you know, different heritages all around me. And, and for some reason, there's this fear on the right in regard to different cultures. I know that you, uh, Anne, have spoken extensively about, you know, oh my God, English is no longer going to be the main language in the United States. 
That's not true. That's not true. And besides which, why does it make you so uncomfortable to hear people speak Spanish, right? Um, and then you also refer to your own uh, family members as settlers. Well, okay, so they got the luck of the draw and they were able to come into this country and settle without, you know, people discriminating against them and stopping them from doing so. But who are we to say, oh, Mexicans can't come in because, as you say, you think they're peasants. I don't think they're peasants. I actually think that they enrich this country with their culture. So. Questions. First of all, this, this sneering mocking of Americans who suddenly wake up one day and find out there no one is speaking um, English in their neighborhoods, um, I think is extremely elitist and snooty. I'm quite sure you all wouldn't like it if your kids came home from school and they sounded like Sarah Palin. Um, I think that would be a cultural shock for you. Certainly in California, um, most of the neighborhoods that have gone all Hispanic are black neighborhoods and not through casual, casual movement. Um, one of the ways our culture changes with, with, with immigration, both legal and illegal, is there is, um, there is not a lot of tolerance, as much tolerance as Americans have. Um, you have black gangs, or um, rather Hispanic gangs, going into the black neighborhoods, screaming epithets, throwing bottles at their houses. The LA Times has written this up extensively. Um, so I think it's very um, sneering and mocking of you to re be referring to mostly African-American and other immigrant neighborhoods that suddenly aren't speaking English and, oh, they're afraid of Spanish. No, they, they think that their kids shouldn't be turned away from a job at McDonald's because they don't speak Spanish. Um, that was one, one witness's testimony in Congress, a black guy from Los Angeles. Um, and... Um, I'm settlers, not, why does it make a difference that you're a settler? No, it isn't that we just first, first come, first serve. No, it's that settlers created this country. It wasn't here. Um, and yeah, a lot of things change when we bring in particularly such large numbers. I mean, there's a reason that the main immigration restrictionist group in the country is called Numbers USA, not, you know, Mexican suck. USA, it's that we do need to assimilate people to this wonderful country of ours where, where we do learn to be tolerant and not practice racism or anti-Semitism and respect one another. Um, oh, well, for those of you who think that anti-Semitism has gotten worse, the ADL does studies on this every year, and every year they find that the main practitioners of anti-Semitism are your Hispanic friends. So um, you might want to reconsider the mass just amnestying them all as they're coming in. No, we, I mean, we do have a wonderful country um, and we need to take time to assimilate people, not let them live in ghettos and bring in their cultures. There's a reason they left their cultures to come to our culture and we didn't leave our culture to go to theirs. Um. When... Um When you say the settlers created the country, are you including the enslaved Americans as settlers, or is that a separate group? Yes, I am, actually. They were settlers? Um, not settlers in that sense, but, I mean, as many people have pointed out, we, we are not a multiracial country, we are not a multicultural country, we are a biracial country. For 400 years, this country was black and white. Um, and we have had black people here as long as is, white Is this people. a biracial country? And African Americans... I mean, can I finish this point? It seems to have set off the crowd. Um, look, African Americans obviously um, got the short end of the stick for about 200 years. This is why I was, I was explaining on the last panel. This is why we have civil rights. Um, this is why we have constitutional provisions. This is why we allow, um, this is why we have affirmative action. It wasn't the Rainbow Coalition. 
It was to make up to redress specific grievances done to African Americans, slavery, Jim Crow laws, um, and now suddenly, you know, everybody's running across the border and, oh, me too, me too, I'm part of this. No, 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 no. No, civil rights are for African Americans. They are not for people who arrived yesterday or last week. We didn't do anything to you. Republicans didn't do anything to anybody. Okay, um, okay. Uh, um, I mean, I, there's just, wow, I don't even know where to start. So in that long-winded rant, uh, you proceeded to insult uh, people in a racist way and then have the audacity to say that our immigration policies are racist or allowing more immigrants in uh, would lead to more racism. It's, it's absurd. How is anything I said way, racist? You said you just talked about people speaking Spanish and how they're how they're how parents don't want to hear that because they're concerned that their kids might want to end up working at McDonald's. You're assuming no, 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 that no, people no, no. are you coming into listening. this country. No, you weren't listening. Yeah. No, there was, there was a testimony before Congress from L.A. communities where black witnesses were going in saying, my kid applied to the local McDonald's, they wouldn't hire him because he didn't speak Spanish. It is mostly <laughs> well, black communities that are yeah. being overwhelmed with illegal immigrants and to be mocking them and saying they're afraid of Spanish people, I think is very dismissive and insulting. Well, here's what happens in this free... Hold on. Here's... You like the free market, right? You love the free market. I love the free market as well. As long as you don't have... Let me finish my point. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Um, in a free market, uh, of course, there will be competition for certain jobs, right? And so the most skilled worker is likely to get that position. Being bilingual is a skill. You're able to communicate. And, and I get it. If you're not bilingual, it makes you uncomfortable. You're not as competitive. But guess what? You know, we live in a country where you have all the resources at your fingertips. You can learn a language for free online. And so enough with this victimhood, because I feel like there's a lot of victimhood coming from you right now, right? If you want to compete for these jobs, go out there and learn. Pick yourself up by the bootstraps. Learn a new language. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. You know, we, we only have an hour, and not only is the hootenanny going on cutting into time, but if you would spend more time making arguments and not characterizing me, we'd have way more okay. time. Okay, so you started the last one. You're going to start this one. We're going to start talking about criminal justice a little bit. Okay. Uh, it's a big moment this week when the president gave a speech in front of a room full of uh, police officers and suggested that they should be rougher <laughs> with the suspects, I mm -hmm. think that's a fair characterization of what he said, uh, and the officers applauded that, right. so apparently they agree with him. Should police officers be rougher with suspects? Being rougher with, I mean, I don't know how much more rough you can be when we live in a country that justifies the slaying of a 12-year-old kid who's playing with a toy gun at a park. Um, I don't know how much rougher cops can be when you have uh, a yoga and meditation teacher getting shot within a second of arriving to a police car. By the way, a police car that she called to report a sexual assault in her alleyway. But to be fair, the cops were startled. So since they were startled, it was okay to shoot and kill that woman, um, who again called the police because she trusted them and thought that they would look out for, uh, you know, whoever was uh, being assaulted in that alleyway. Um, so I don't know how much rougher cops can be. I mean, look, I think that it is true that cops have an incredibly difficult job, and we're living in a country that's swimming in guns. And so the paranoia is understandable. But at the same time, there needs to be a real conversation without fear-mongering about what we can do to make sure that cops do their jobs effectively so 12-year-olds aren't shot, or an individual who's literally running away from the cops doesn't get shot, or if someone lets a cop know, hey, I have a licensed gun in the glove compartment, that individual doesn't get shot right away, right? Well, 
the peaceful yoga instructor was shot because of immigration combined with this insane idea that we owe immigrants affirmative action. This Somali was rushed through the Minneapolis police cadets exam, violated about four rules off the top of my head so that the good people of Minnesota could brag about having a real live Somali on the police force. Um, that was what, and what killed Justine Damon. Um, and we didn't do anything to the Somalis. What we did was send them food, which the warlords took, so we sent in a fighting force to make sure they got food. There was no slavery, no Jim Crow to make up for, and yet, oh, they arrived yesterday, so they get affirmative action on but the police. So you're in favor of supporting cops, um, and you're in favor of cops uh, shooting Trump's and killing joke, unarmed individuals, I think it's gonna unless be... they're Somali. Because if they're Somali, well, then they must be terrorists, and that's the reason why they decided to I open said fire. Nothing of it's the ridiculous. Sort. The inconsistencies but, but the, the in the argument. If you lower standards, you won't get cops that are as good. That's a fact. It has nothing to do with terrorism. As for what Trump said, I mean, look, you guys, have at it. If you want to adopt the feminist motto of that's not funny, fine. Have at it. I'm sure you'll swing the electorate. Trump was joking. People laughed. Analyzing Trump's every joke is, I think, not helping you. Yeah. So, Killing right. our right. people okay, is real so, funny. So, yeah, love okay, it. Okay. I mean, it, it could have been a joke. It did seem very borscht spell. The whole thing was very jocular. I don't know. Maybe he was joking. But okay, let's go a little broader with the same point, right? Black Lives Matter has spent years saying we have a policing violence problem. Do we have a police violence problem? Um, not as much as we have a black males killing black males problem. And that's, I mean, I think I care more about black lives. It is cops that are trying to save black lives, are putting their lives on the line to save black lives. Um, that's, I, I mean, I also think that so much of this is brushing what I think the original problem is under, under the rug, and I don't want to drag us in a completely different direction, but it is the destruction of the black family by the welfare state, paying women to have illegitimate children. And once you start with that, you know, it's, it's, I mean, all is lost at a young age, and I think that's mm. what we really need. I wish instead of spending so much time trying to assimilate and English as a second language, if instead in the 60s we had just spent it all on African Americans, I think we'd be a lot better off. Yeah. You know, we also have a problem in the country of white men killing white men because guess what? Criminals kill people in their areas and we live in segregated neighborhoods. And so if you look at the numbers, you see the same thing when it comes to white individuals. So that right-wing talking point is empty to say the least. Um, but anyway. Go ahead. It, sorry, sorry, sorry. Again, try to get into the heart of the issue. Is there racial bias in the criminal justice system? In the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander talks about mm -hmm. black people are over-arrested, over-prosecuted, over-convicted, and over-sentenced. Well, right? I, I, my favorite stat when it comes to that has to do with marijuana, because I love marijuana. So, um, <laughs> so... It's, it's, it's interesting because uh, there was a study looking specific, hell yeah, a study looking specifically into um, m marijuana use rates. And they compared white marijuana users to black marijuana users. And the researchers found, all right, they use marijuana at similar rates. But it's interesting because blacks are four times more likely to be arrested and prosecuted for marijuana possession. Which is, by the way, I don't care if you're black, white, Asian, Latino, it doesn't matter, you shouldn't be prosecuted for marijuana possession. That's a gigantic waste of our resources. But I found that study so interesting because, again, we're talking about similar rates, but why is it that one group gets targeted more often than the other group? Oh, I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, the, this is based on self-reports. There have been further studies where they actually drug test the person after asking, do you smoke pot? Have you smoked pot in the last week? And it turns out there's a racial difference in telling the truth on did you smoke pot. Blacks were about 10 times more likely to lie and say they hadn't smoked pot. Um, point two, 
You can find you can find it. I'll I'll email it to you and you can post it. Um, but the and the second point is um, nobody goes to prison for possession of pot. That's untrue. More than untrue. No, I know you're all potheads and you're going to have trouble following what I'm about to say. But as you will be able to read in, in, your, in, in, in failing New York Times, um, a, almost 90% of people in prison are in prison as a result of a plea bargain. No one gets arrested and tried for possession of marijuana. They're cut, but, but, but if they happen to have marijuana on them, that's what they plea it down to. You don't need witnesses. But, you don't need a trial. Um, but so it may be on the record, but you're not going to prison for that. You're going to prison because you held up a liquor store with a sawed-off shotgun and they found pot on you. No. Uh, may I jump in? This is, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I did a TEDx talk on it, so there's been a lot of research into this. Um, why do you guys think we have private prisons? Why are our taxpayer dollars going toward private prisons? Um, and why do we even need them, right? Don't we have county prisons, federal prisons? Well, it's because in uh, the 1980s, because of Republican leadership, uh, we passed a bunch of draconian laws, specifically in regard to marijuana. And so our prison systems, uh, all of a sudden, were just filled with people who got caught with possession of pot, right? And so, you know, these entrepreneurs see that there's some, you know, there's an entrepreneurial uh, opportunity here. And so you have the emergence of uh, Corrections Corporation of America and Geo Group. And guess what they did? They're like, give us your nonviolent drug offenders and make us rich. So your tax dollars aren't really re going to welfare recipients and all these little guys that, you know, people want to distract you with. They're going to private industries like private prisons who have a vested interest to criminalize nonviolent individuals, particularly those who get caught with drugs. Should marijuana be legal? Um, no, you can legalize all the drugs you want once there isn't a welfare state. But no, marijuana makes people retarded. Um, especially when they're young. We've got enough busboys. We're bringing in busboys by the million through our immigration policy. We do not need a country of busboys. We're destroying the country. Should marijuana be legal? Absolutely. In fact, I wish you would smoke a joint and uh, relax a little bit. Um, marijuana does not make people the word that you just said, which is ridiculous. Um, how many of you guys don't have to raise your hands if you feel uncomfortable. How many of you guys smoke pot? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, there are lawmakers in this country that would like to see you in prison. Jeff Sessions happens to be one of them, okay? In fact, marijuana laws have been so draconian that it has allowed members of the uh, DEA to do something known as civil uh, asset forfeiture, which is if you are even suspected of being in possession of drugs or trafficking drugs, they can go ahead and take your home, they can take your money, they can take your car, they can take your property, because, hey, they're investigating you. And guess what? Only a tiny fraction of those individuals ever get their property back. You don't have to be convicted of anything. You don't have to even face any serious charges. It's just based on suspicion. And Obama actually brought that back a little bit, reeled it back in a little bit. Jeff Sessions comes into power and all of a sudden, no, 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 civil asset forfeiture, awesome. Let's take property away from these innocent Americans who haven't done anything wrong, but hey, our local police enforcement and the DEA need some resources, so let's go ahead and confiscate their property. That's what's happening with the drug war right now. Um. Our time is up. Ah. This has been extraordinary. I think this is what Politicon is about. Both sides talking, arguing passionately. Thank you guys. Thank you, Anna Kasparian. Thank you, Ann Coulter.